Okay, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to our seventh Cosmic Conversations talk for this year, and it's the second last one, so it's going to be eight in total. And today we have uh, Unatus Fasano. He is a PhD student uh, with Professor Taylor, and he's going to talk about uh, Bell's inequality, the famous Bell inequality. Thank you, Unatus. Cool, cool, cool. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction and. Um, yeah, as, as uh, Gerard has said, I'll be here to talk about um, Bell's theorem, which is kind of like this um, an, an inequality that divided uh, a generation of physics. And yeah, it's kind of, I guess, a, a significant bit of history that happened quite some time ago. And essentially in 2022, um, this piece of history was eventually, I guess, adorned with the famous Nobel Prize, and it was awarded to uh, these three guys, Alan Aspect, John Clauser, and Anton Zellinger. And um, the prize was given for, I quote, experiments with entangled photons establishing the violation of Bell inequalities and pioneering quantum information science. But, um, the events that kind of led to this uh, price actually started much, much earlier, and they go back to as far as the late 19th century. And essentially, this talk will kind of go through like the historical context and some of the debates that took place and the experiment that yeah, Bell's theorem inspired. And it actually starts at a very unlikely place. And yeah, it actually starts with like an object you probably least expect. And essentially that object is the incandescent light bulb. Now in 1880, Thomas Edison patented the incandescent light bulb, which I guess everyone knows kind of consists of like a filament, which is like a metallic object that when you heat, you heat up this filament, the light bulb glows. And during the same time, um, Germany was kind of rapidly industrializing and many German engineering companies had actually spent like millions uh, buying the European version of this patent. And I guess to get a, a return on their investment, they were kind of interested in improving the original design by Thomas Edison. and. At the time, the incandescent light bulb was kind of very inefficient. I think it still is. Like for the electric coal power you put in, you kind of get like 15% to 30% out that's actually uh, light. Most of it is just heat. And yeah, essentially the, 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 the physics of the time, well, at the time, the underlying, the physics underlying how the light bulb glowed was kind of somewhat of a mystery. And I guess this is kind of what attracted oops, the, the attention of physicists. And most of the physicists at the time actually believed that physics was um, almost kind of like complete. And what actually remained in physics was just, you know, a few engineering problems that were really not that important. And going from this, I guess people kind of tried to understand the light bulb in terms of the best physics at the time. Um, and yeah, you see it summarized by this guy, Johan Dolly, which he says, in this field, which is referring to physics, almost everything is discovered and all that remains is just unimportant holes. Um, so then, at the time, the best physics, uh, or um, the, the 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 light or the radiation emitted by the light bulb, um, was sort of understood as being or consisting of electromagnetic waves with different colors carried by different frequency waves, and 
such a, an object such as the light bulb or the filament in the light bulb at thermal equilibrium we kind of emit light at all frequency and the intensity or the energy density of the light emitted would be proportional to the frequency squared which is given by the form that i've given there and i guess if you scrutinize this formula and take a look at it more uh, intimately you realize that it predicts that for hot objects such as the sun it says that they would emit light at small wavelengths with an arbitrarily large density um this is because if you i guess turn the, the frequency and write it in terms of wavelengths then it goes over one over to the fourth of the wavelength of the emitted light and if you look at the corresponding graph it actually predicts that the sun as you go to the side of um, UV radiation, the intensity would basically shoot up to infinity. And I guess more practically, this means that, for example, if your luggage went through one of those X-ray scanners at the airport, it would probably not make it to the other side, not because it possesses something illegal, but basically because the X-ray scanner would just evaporize it. <laughs> Um, and then, funny enough, as as, as down history would happen, uh, one of one of Jolly's former students, who he advised to actually not go into physics, <laughs> uh, took on this problem. And um, Max Planck actually worked on this problem for quite some time with little success. Maybe he should have listened to his advisor. And in what he called an act of despair, he kind of abandoned trying to explain what was happening with the light bulb with the existing theoretical framework. And he kind of tried to work back from experiment. Um, and his assumption was that um, instead of light as being like a, something that resembles a wave as being continuous, it was that the energy in light was actually not continuous, but was rather packaged in like discrete energy packets he called quanta. And from that assumption, working it into his existing theoretical framework, he was able to come up with the theoretical form for the energy density of, a, uh, of the light bulb filament that had the correct form and match experiment. But uh, by Max Planck's own admission, he actually admitted that he did not see the connection or like deeply understand it. And he has this quote that, yeah, basically his assumption of quanta was a purely formal assumption to which he did not think about too much. Basically, it was kind of like a mathematical trick he used to explain the experimental data. And yeah, I guess this, this euphoria if you, if you want to call it that, it didn't last for too long. As a few years later, there would be kind of another physical phenomenon um, that would kind of blow things out of the water. Um, and this was, I guess, uh, it, 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 it was stumbled across by another German physicist, uh, Hertz, who was investigating basically ways to produce and receive electromagnetic waves. And um, I guess the experimental apparatus he used to do this um, resembles something like this. So it had two coils, which had a gap in between them. And whenever an electromagnetic wave um, was detected by these coils, it would ignite the, the gap in between. So you would see a spark in between the two coils. And what Hertz found that when he actually put this experimental apparatus in a dark box to actually try to see the spark better, he realized that um, the spark that was produced was actually shortened. And it was shortened in regards to when it was actually outside the box. And um, this was kind of mysterious because it kind of hinted at a connection between light and electricity 
And to actually understand, I guess, this experiment better, there's like a more sensitive version, a more modern version of the apparatus we use called the gold leaf um, electroscope, which I've shown there on, on the slide. And um, essentially, this object. Yeah, essentially these objects uh, consist of a zinc plate at the top. And this zinc plate is inside is um, connected at the bottom to a gold leaf. Um, and what's inside the, the, the box is kind of insulated from the outside. Um, so to emulate what Hertz kind of saw, what you initially do is that you impart electrostatic charge on the zinc plate, which then makes it its way down the um, down the object onto the gold leaf, and I guess if there's a charge imbalance, then the gold leaf would um, deflect from the from the um, zinc plate, and depending on how much charge there is, it would deflect much further. And what actually happens when you impart charge on this object, and maybe take like a torch and shine it on the zinc plate, um, nothing actually happens. As you can see, our demonstrator here has already loaded negative charge on the plate and is shining visible light on it. But what was strange is that when you took, and yeah, it's important to mention that no matter how much intense the visible light source was, um, nothing would actually happen to the gold leaf. And if you changed it to the if you change the light source to an ultraviolet source, no matter how intense that ultraviolet source is, it actually stops or discharges the, the, the gold leaf plate. So it kind of, it was as if the light source was actually removing the charge from the gold leaf and thus causing it to go back to its natural position. And um, yeah, this was kind of a complete mystery because, you know, people understood light as having like, or as being like these packets of energy, basically propagating, uh, or sorry, these waves of energy propagating through space. And people kind of thought of um, thought of this problem in terms of that in, in terms of that uh, picture, that basically electrons on a metallic surface kind of have a work work function. And if you have enough energy, you can actually displace some of these electrons. And depending on basically the intensity of the light source, if the intensity is pretty high, you would displace these electrons at, at a pretty high kinetic energy because you kind of be imparting energy on it. But as we see, this was obviously at odds. What we're seeing here was obviously at odds to what was yeah, commonly expected. And I guess, as you might know, uh, that particular effect was called the electro, electro photoelectric effect. And it was eventually, I guess, explained by this gentleman over here. And basically, Einstein posited that, yeah, we should kind of stop thinking of light as, you know, energy waves propagating in space. But we should think of light as, as Max has said, like these discrete energy packets. And he posited that the energy in each photon was kind of equal to the frequency of the light source multiplied by a constant he later called the Planck's constant. And oops, through this, he was actually able to explain the photoelectric effect. So what's actually happening is that the electrons in, in the metallic surface um, are only susceptible to photons that have a frequency above some, some threshold. And if you have a frequency below that threshold, the intensity actually doesn't matter. Um, the photons only start getting displaced above, um, yeah, this, the, 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 the the, the the frequency threshold and i guess that frequency threshold would be the property of the metal and um, yeah as you can see Aldo einstein looking at i guess an invention that's one of his uh the results of his theory as you kind of change the the the, the frequency of the light source by its color you drag it around you see that the light bulb initially doesn't react to this but eventually if you get to the i guess the bluer uh, wavelengths um the light bulb starts reacting to this and it 
actually turns on. So it means that above, yeah, basically the threshold, electrons are being displaced from the object that the light is shining on and going into the light bulb and just making it glow. And yeah, essentially by, by explaining the photoelectric effect, Einstein can also kind of explain uh, the ultraviolet uh, catastrophe in a sense. And I guess people were kind of now confused because I guess a century earlier, Young had shown that you know, light behaved like a wave, which was responsible for like shadows and the interference pattern. And now Einstein was saying that light behaved like a particle, which would explain the photoelectric effect. And while like the European mind was kind of stretching their, scratching their heads over this question, um, there were kind of, there were two physicists in North America, um, Davison and Gemma, uh, who conducted an, an experiment which was actually not related to light. Um, and basically in their, in their experiment, they fired an electron beam towards a crystal and they wanted to see what would happen um, to the electrons and uh, basically how they would be scattered by, by the surface of the crystal. And yeah, essentially to kind of analyze the, the, the experiment that Davison and, um, and Gemma conducted, we can actually look at an analogous experiment which was conducted by Young uh, a century earlier. And basically, what Young observed is that if you have a coherent light source, say a laser beam, and basically pointed towards two narrow slits, um, what you observe, what you would observe, is something that resembles like uh, something like what I've shown on the screen there. Is that essentially as the light source propagates through space and squeezes through the gaps you kind of see these patterns of interference. So when some of the waves are peaked and then they meet other peaks, they lead to a larger wave. And when some of these waves are peaked and one is uh, at a value, and when they meet, they cancel one another out. And I guess if you set up a screen detector far enough and you record this, uh, what you actually see is the so-called interference pattern, which is kind of these bands of light and darkness, which indicate these um, peaks meeting peaks and peaks meeting valleys, All right? And um, basically what Davidson and, and, and Gemma were expecting to see, or by common sense, is that electrons were kind of understood as being like tiny objects tiny subatomic particles. And essentially in the experiment, when you did this, uh, what was expected is that some of the electrons would actually individually go through each slit. And most of them would actually just hit the, the borders and bounce back. And what you, you would expect to see on the screen um, is essentially a projection of the electrons um, at the projection, or at least very close um, to where the slits are, basically, um, right? This is this was kind of the like the common commonsensical um, expectation of the experiment conducted by Davison and and Gemma. But like, what they actually saw was yeah something quite strange. Um, so. This is actually experimental data from one of these experiments. Is that if you if you perform this experiment and shoot electrons at those two gaps, um, what you see is actually a pattern that is like characteristic of a coherent light source. So like you see bands of light and bands of darkness, and you might suggest that maybe okay, maybe the electron beam that they use uh, has many electrons such that maybe when they go through the interface or the gaps. They collide in some way and produce this pattern. But um, some of the more sophisticated versions of, the of this experiment 
is that this pattern actually builds up even when you shoot the electrons individually. So it's as if, I guess, each electron individually is showing behavior that resembles a coherent light source in that it eventually produces this interference pattern. All right. Now, I guess things got, yeah, really dicey at this point in puzzling. Um, so light, originally thought of as a wave, was behaving like a particle according to Einstein. And electrons, originally thought of as particles, were now behaving like light according to Davison and, and, uh, and Gemma. And um, essentially, quantum mechanics was created to kind of explain this, this result. And um, the originators of quantum me uh, mechanics kind of explain the results in the following way. Um, so essentially what happens when an electron is shot through this gap um, is that, yeah, so first of all, we can actually not talk of the electron as being a physical object or the, the thing that goes through the gap, we cannot talk of it as a physical object, but instead we can talk of it as some kind of mathematical object Called, they call the wave function, which kind of is unphysical, but it passes through the two gaps and shows these interference pattern as if it were a wave. And eventually when it gets to the detector, when we try to measure it, this ethereal wave thing is kind of coerced into becoming a real physical object which eventually hits the screen and then we can see it. Um, yeah, this was, a, this was somewhat of a, uh, for the time, uh, a very outlandish, uh, outlandish claim. But, and as you can imagine, um, Einstein actually hated this, this interpretation. Um, and, it was championed by this guy, brilliant Danish physicist Niels Bohr, who was actually one of the originators of um, this interpretation of the result. And particularly the interpretation was called the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, because yeah, essentially its originators came up with it while they were at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. Um, yeah, while I was actually researching this topic, um, I found some interesting facts about this fella. Uh, apparently, he was actually a brilliant footballer, and he actually played for uh, one of the Danish teams that were in the first division in, in, in Danish football. And I guess more funnier, um, apparently, he cancelled his wedding and honeymoon to go work on his paper for the atomic theory. <laughs> that was very funny. Uh, but any, anyhow, uh, yeah, essentially, he, he championed this kind of weird explanation of the result we just saw. And basically, standing on the opposite corner was Albert Einstein. And he, at this time, he was kind of at the peak of his, of his popularity. And essentially, the, the battle was set for these guys to clash. And apparently, both guys were kind of known for their, for their stubborn character to their, to their own ideas kind of like an immovable object meets an unstoppable force kind of scenario. And yeah, apparently in the years that follows, these guys basically argued, uh, and their arguments basically raged on, and it actually produced iconic and legendary sayings such as God does not play dice, and essentially Niels Bohr's reply, that it's not for you to say what God is to do with his dice, and when Niels Bohr kind of affirmed the, 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 his, his Copenhagen interpretation that essentially what we're observing there doesn't come into reality until we quote unquote measure it, Einstein replied, does the moon cease to exist when I'm not looking at it? Um, as you can kind of tell from, 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 from these quotes, you can kind of tell the general mood between the two camps. And essentially in 19, 85, um, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen thought they, they had kind of found 
um, they kind of found a, a flaw in, in, in this interpretation of quantum mechanics. And essentially the argument goes something like this, um, is that if, you're, if you accept that basically quantum mechanics or reality is probabilistic, then it implies that if you have like two particles that interact in the past and then are move apart, then according to the Copenhagen interpretation, then the act of measuring one of these systems would instantly influence or affect the other particle, no matter how far apart they are. And this kind of seems to suggest that information could somehow travel faster than the speed of light. And Einstein didn't like this and he referred to, to it as spooky action at a distance. And I guess why, why he didn't like it, it kind of also contradicted his uh, theory of relativity, which kind of said that no influence could, I guess, travel through space and time faster than the speed of light. And I guess he proposed something, I guess, to him kind of more commonsensical. Um, it was not that these systems were influencing each other over space and time, but there were some variables that quantum mechanics did not account for. And these variables were determined long before we actually measured these two particles. And essentially, when we measure these particles to, I guess, measure some physical property, um, the systems or the act of measuring does not instantaneously influence the other system. But because, uh, because the, 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 essentially, the physical property you are measuring is already fixed before we even measure it, then the only thing that basically changes is the observer's knowledge or ignorance about the system. So essentially no spooky action at a distance. By measuring the system, we are just updating our own knowledge about the system. And essentially Bohr replied with a kind of tiny cheek reply. He named his paper basically the same title as Einstein's. And he basically reaffirmed that, you know, it's not that quantum mechanics is incomplete or there's something missing. It's just that it's fundamentally different. And um, he came up with a concept he called complementarity, which basically posits that if you have two pairs of certain properties of a system, um, it is such that these properties can't be known precisely um, at the same time. So, for example, he made the example of position, uh, the example of uh, position and the speed of a particle. So, by precisely knowing where, where the particle that goes through the two gaps is, you essentially disturb it, and then you can't precisely know what its speed is, and essentially vice versa. This was kind of the crux of of, of Bohr's argument. So then, uh, I guess, which which one was it? Was it you know, the physical world is deterministic or is deterministic and objects in it have a definite reality and they are independent of observation, which is called determinism and locality. Or was it that the physical world is inherently undeterministic and objects do not have a definite reality before they are measured and they influence one another instantaneously across space time. And this view was called non-determinism and, and locality. And essentially, yeah, this kind of back and forth between Bohr and Einstein kind of died out because Europe was like kind of plunged into war and people kind of forgot about it. And when physicists came back, basically they adopted the shut up and calculate mode. They were more interested in using quantum mechanics to do engineering stuff um, or explain physical phenomena rather than some useless metaphysical speculation. But I guess to a select few, this was not the case. And an unknown Irish physicist called John Bell would actually come along and formulate an argument that would rule out one of these, one of these worldviews, essentially. And to, to follow Bell's argument, let's consider a simple version of it, which kind of consists of two key points. Uh, essentially, the key point is, one of the key points is basic, basically a formal definition of locality. And the other key point is that this definition should actually produce predictions that are experimentally falsifiable. And we'll see what this means in the slides that follow. So let's start with the definition of locality. Um, essentially, the goal of physics is to is explain 
the entire universe. But um, in physics, to explain the entire universe, we never look at the entire universe as in its totality. We usually like study tiny pockets of the universe that we might call system or object or whatever that are kind of isolated to a region of space and time. And we say that these objects have a state, basically properties that characterize this object. Examples include position, momentum, charge, and so on. And under the assumption of locality, um, all physical properties of the particular system we are studying is kind of uniquely determined by the state of that system, which I've indicated as X here. And essentially, in addition to this, if we study our system and subject it to experiment, the experimental results we obtain um, will only depend on the state X and on the surrounding environment of where the system is. And essentially, if you have a disturbance or an event somehow D distance away from the laboratory, the laboratory which we are conducting our experiment, it will not have an effect on our experiment in less than D divided by C seconds, and definitely not instantaneously. Um, and then if, we, if, you, if you take this definition of local of locality seriously, then you can set up like these three simple experiments where you subject X to, a, to some test, and this test basically spits out a zero or one to tell you whether the test passed or failed. And if you subject it to a state X, which kind of has, I guess, three properties, B, A, B, and C, then two systems which have or which correspond to kind of the uh, different rows of this table that I've shown to kind of show all the possibilities of these experiments. If two rows are different, that are different, then we can say that they have different states. So then if we proceed with this experiment and basically look at particular scenarios, essentially where test A passes and test B does not pass, and we look at a, another scenario where test B passes and test C does not pass. And finally, we look at the last scenario where test A passes and C does not. And essentially, if you look at the table there, you will see that um, whenever test A passes and test C does not, correspondingly, we will have a scenario where test A passes and test B does not. And another scenario where we'll have test B passing and test C not passing. Right? But we can see that uh, test B passing and test C not passing can happen independently of, of test A passing and test C passing. And this is also true for uh, test A passing mm -hmm. and test B failing. And, and essentially, if you take into account what I've just said, you can formulate this kind of inequality. And if you had, say, a large ensemble of these particles in the state X, and then you subject them, subjected them to all three tests, uh, you would basically end up with counts that indicate how many times each of these tests uh, happened, or each of these scenarios happened. And I guess if you divide those counts by the total number of times you try the experiment, you end up with probabilities. And essentially, this is a simple version of, uh, of, of Bell's, um, of Bell's uh, in, uh, theorem. Essentially, it says that if you take locality to be serious, then if it were to happen that this inequality was violated, then that would mean that our assumptions of local reality would be wrong. And in, in 1964, John Bell actually published this result. And for more than four years, it was actually ignored. And no one actually paid any attention to him. And um, in 1969, actually, Bell received a letter from a young experimental physicist by the name of John Clauser regarding his theorem. And this apparently was the first communication that Bell had received um, from any physicist regarding basically Bell's theorem. 
And um, essentially, Kroza thought that Bell's theorem could be modified such that it could be tested in a laboratory. And actually, his supervisor actually rebuffed him to not work on this because he was probably yeah, working, uh, wasting his time on something that did not have any practical consequence, but was just metaphysical speculation. And that time, John was a, was a PhD, and he actually finished his PhD without, without, um, without uh, pursuing this further. He kind of worked on it from time to time as kind of his pet project, until he became a, a postdoc. And his faculty sponsor actually allowed him um, to spend some of his time pursuing this, this project to set up an experimental test to evaluate Bell's theorem. And he actually scavenged some parts from the lab he was working in and basically duct taped them together to basically set up the first experimental test to, set, uh, to test Bell's theorem. And um, unfortunately, I could not, um, nowadays, like these kinds of experiments have been done repeatedly. And um, Alan Aspect and Anton Zilinga basically produce more accurate versions of this experiment. And nowadays you can actually do it in an undergraduate lab, um, but these experiments are kind of heavy and very sensitive to photons. So I could not bring one with me today, but uh, luckily we can actually have some fun with a, with, with a digital version of, of, of this experiment. Um, so yeah, this is supposed to resemble what uh, Clauser and Allen Aspect and the like would have done. So essentially you have some light source in the middle, which produces pairs of photons. And basically these pairs of photons are sent to two labs, Alice and Bob. And basically Alice and Bob uh, measure a property of these uh, photons sorry, uh, called polarization. And, and then they record their results. And basically at the end, they compared, they compare their results for four, for four tests. And essentially these four tests are done by essentially changing the angle of the, of the, of the polarizers they have in, in, in their labs. And essentially as Krosa, Allen Aspect and Anton Zelinga would have done, if you actually run this experiment, um, you will see I guess a few a few iterations of it, and and according to to Bell's theorem, if you do this experiment and take the results from these four settings and add them in a specific way, if local reality is true, then you would expect that the sum of these numbers should be essentially two. The maximum you can get would be essentially two, and. Essentially, if we see something that's, or the sum of these large numbers being larger than two, then we would have to abandon local reality as being wrong. And essentially this is what Anton Zelena, Krauser, and um, Alan Aspect observed, is that you get, you do indeed get a large number, that, uh, a number that's larger than two, which, basically forces us to abandon that our reality is local and non-deterministic. But uh, I must say that it actually does not, I, I guess it does not really prove that Bohr was right, but it kind of proves that Einstein was wrong in a sense. And yeah, essentially, this is a quote from Alan's aspect, which kind of summarizes what they observed in the experiment. As you say, the experimental violation of Bell's inequality confirms that the pair of entangled photons separated by hundreds of meters not, cannot be considered to be a non superable object. Uh, essentially, it is impossible to assign a local reality to each photon. Um, yeah, essentially, this, this kind of, I guess, concludes this, this uh, piece of history. And what is fascinating to me at least is that quantum mechanics um, is kind of very good at predicting physical phenomena and it's actually 
does so quite well and it's very unambiguous in, in that sense but it kind of fails to give us a kind of readily available uh, an intuitive understanding of what's beneath uh, reality. And I believe like in a sense, this is what kind of frustrated Einstein, even though quantum mechanics is good at making predictions, which is what we require of a scientific theory. It, it just doesn't give us a readily un uh, understandable uh, explanation of what basically our physical reality consists of. And in a sense, these experiments kind of show, as Einstein had feared, that the moon doesn't really exist until you look at it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Marty, for a very nice and interactive talk. Um, if there are any questions, please feel free to ask. Yeah. Um, so that experiment that violated the Hopkins inequality, that sort of like advocated for one local energy. What's one local energy? Well, it kind of advocates for non locality by basically discrediting locality. But then it doesn't say non locality is definitely true. It just discredits the locality, you have to abandon it. So then information can probably pass through to the lab. Well, I'm not sure if you, if you can definitely say that. But essentially, it says that, um, yeah, our assumption of locality that you know things have a definite reality and cannot travel faster than the speed of light are basically incompatible with quantum mechanics. Whether they can travel faster than the speed of light or not, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't, I'm not sure that we understand what's you know, happening. We can certainly say for sure what it is that's happening. Just before I go, there's another subtlety, I'm not going to reverse it now, which shows that people that can't send a message faster than the speed of light. Because it's something they're not going to be able to. Um, say now, but but you know, I want to say is, if, if, have you heard of, in terms of the nuance of speaking about non-locality, that sense that you have two things that are separate, but you measure this photon spin over here, and you immediately know what this photon spin over here is, but you you can't say, well, this is why I'm interested in the language. You wouldn't say that the measurement causes. <laughs> Yeah, because causation for you requires passing information. So you, I don't know what, what words are used in that sense. So because when you, and I love that quote that you put up from that aspect of sense of it. So it's an inseparable object. Yeah. That's the thing that it, so it's, it's an object that exists across space. Yeah. 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 Like there's a subtlety that works out for you. So what happens when you measure this photon? Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess, like you said, you can't actually talk of the photons as being independent of each other. You kind of have to talk of the system as, you know, in totality. And I guess maybe that's what's confusing about quantum mechanics. Maybe like our language kind of, you know, obscures what. Yeah, exactly. So you, you use the word effects. So the measurement of this photon affects this photon. Like, so you can say the cause and the difference between cause and well, essentially, if you view this in terms of a quantum indeterminacy, the wave function has not collapsed until you perform a measurement. But performing a measurement here, in a sense, determines what happens to the entanglement of the wave as well. So you could interpret this as saying this measurement here non locally affects yeah. a hypothetical measurement yeah. somewhere else. Yeah. yeah, basically, Einstein was arguing that was arguing against that by saying it doesn't affect it because basically the photons at birth were created and they had those physical properties. And by looking at it, you're just updating your knowledge. But yeah, I guess basically the validation of Bell's inequality says otherwise. Because so, uh, you said that uh, around that, like, you said you're talking about changing the state from x1 to x2, like, you have the state. It's almost like, so you're not. 
We're not changing the states of that photon. We're actually bringing about the state. Yeah, it seems like the, the basically the, the photon just comes into existence from its wave function. Uh, well, in, in this case, for the electrons, when you pass them through the gap, what's before the gap is kind of the wave function of the electron that's passing through the gap. And basically, by you looking at it at the detector, you're kind of coercing it into reality, into becoming an electron. It's kind of, yeah, nuts. <laughs> no, I'm not. I think basically Feynman said that, you know, if you, if someone says they understand quantum mechanics, then yeah, probably mistaken. <laughs> So the second variable stuff, like the data zone, part of the wave stuff, okay, but, but that, it doesn't, that was inequality you brought up. Well, I'm actually not sure. I've never kept up to uh, the current theories regarding hidden hidden variables. I'm sure there's a lot that has been developed since then. I'm just not, not up to date with the best. It's not saying the part of it works, you've got a part of this nuclear thing called the particle is there, so it means the other thing. These hidden variable theories, which are physically unknowable, not the way I try to Confirmation about the body he points to a certain set of larger things, but here he has some of these sort of history things, these things. Do you think we'll head, do you think the ideas around the various interpretations will head more towards uh, more identity variables that are increasingly sort of impossible to measure or increasingly be deposit more complex entities to hold these hidden variables? Yeah, uh, to be honest, I don't really have a real opinion about this. Um, but yeah, I guess in today, people kind of care more about, I guess, yeah, technological innovation that would come from quantum mechanics and not necessarily what quantum mechanics means. So I don't know. Um, yeah, at least to me, I guess it seemed as if this I, will, will be pushed under the rug. I think when I took my basically physics, quantum physics uh, education, yeah, basically the entire mood was that, yeah, shut up and calculate. And just <laughs> ignore, <laughs> ignore, the, ignore the metaphysical, uh, uh, metaphysical speculation surrounding quantum mechanics, just do calculations, you know. Um, so yeah, I don't really have uh, any real opinion regarding this. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Imadi. Thanks, everyone.